Hi, everybody. Um, so it's so great to see all of you here for the first of two special presentations of Law, Gender, and the Political Economy of Social Reproduction, presented by the Program on Law and Political Economy here at Harvard Law School. My name is Sanjay Jolly. I direct the LP program. Uh, and before we get started, I just wanted to thank the law school's facilities, IT, and catering staffs for making all of this possible, and especially our program coordinator, Noah Lawson, for all his efforts in helping to arrange this event. Uh, the development of this series is really to the credit of Professor Hila Shamir, who got us thinking about this question of social reproduction, the material construction of sexuality and gender relations, and its connection to market formations and labor strategy. Hila has been an incredible and gracious collaborator throughout her year here at HLS, and we are truly so grateful for her significant contributions to the program and to the LP community generally. Tomorrow, we'll be continuing tonight's conversation with a lunchtime event with Gila, Claudia Torres, and Yaren Jane uh, on sex and care, law, and the political economy of work. Uh, and we hope you'll join us at 12.15 p.m. in WCC 3016, just upstairs, or on Zoom. Uh, you can find more information about that event and many others at lpe.law.harvard.edu. So we are kicking off this event with a lecture by Professor Janet Halley entitled Some Forgettings, Oikos, Economy, Family, Gender. Janet Halley is the Eli Goldston Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. She is an expert on feminist legal theory, sex, sexuality, gender, and the law, family law, law and humanities, and critical legal studies. Her books include Split Decisions, How and Why to Take a Break from Feminism, and with Hila Shamir, Rachel Rebouche, and Prabhakoti Swaran, Governance Feminism, an Introduction, and its later companion, Governance Feminism, Notes from the Field. Following her remarks, Professor Halley will be joined in conversation by Vanessa Dasa Castillo. Vanessa is an SJD candidate at Harvard Law School. Her work on women's environmental movements in Colombia bridges law and feminist political ecology, furthering our understanding of how gender shapes men and women's access, control, and knowledge about the environment. After a few questions from Vanessa, we will open it up to an audience conversation, and those of you on Zoom can submit questions using the Q&A feature. Uh, and we hope you'll join us afterward for a reception just next door in Milstein Room C. Uh, and with that, please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Janet Halley. Thank uh, the program on law and political economy, and especially Yochai Benkler, there he is, and Sanjay Jolly for uh, arranging this event. I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Sanjay told you, my title is Some Forgettings, Oikos, Economy, Family, Gender. Um, I'm going to be gathering work that I've been doing uh, mostly with Harvard students and former Harvard students now in law teaching, when law teaching jobs all over the world uh, because of the graduate program and the increasing number of um, global students in the JD program. Um, not all credit for these ideas goes to me. This has been collaborative work. Um, and. Uh, I'm going to summarize about 20 years of stuff we've been doing. So I'm trying to make it short and lucid, and I'm uh, quite delighted to share it and interested to hear your thoughts. My starting point is the etymological shift from the Greek word oikos to the a word in English that derived from it, the word economy. Um, uh, I start with Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England, in, published in 1765, the first volume. He classified there the private economical relations of husband, wife, parent, child, guardian, and ward, and at the top of the list, master, servant. Uh, these were hierarchical and reciprocal relations of rights and duties so that, for instance, the husband owed a duty of support and the wife owed a matching duty of obedience. Um, by economical, Blackstone meant household. 
of or this is an OED Oxford English Dictionary uh, definition. It was current at the time um, uh, of or relating to household management or to the prior ordering of private affairs, domestic. Um, husband, wife, parent, child, and guardian, and ward all make sense to us today. There's some family, as it were, resemblance among them, but master and servant? Um, this is a relationship between the master and the laborer, whether that labor was free or under the long-term, often involuntary um, contract called indenture. At the time, but Blackstone published his volume, this volume of his treaties, slavery was of uncertain legality in England. He cited a case that um, had just been decided a few years earlier that said that if a slave stepped on English soil, the slavery status completely dissolved and the, he could be a villain, a villain, but couldn't be a slave, could be a laborer, but not a slave. Um, uh, and he attacks the idea of slavery as a legitimate uh, form of uh, master-servant relation. But the book came over to the United States and was used by early lawyers in the, in the uh, colonial and early republic. And, and there, there was a very gradual abolition of slavery with people looking to Blackstone for authority on the master-servant relation. The social, uh, the social household, at that time was the site of production, consumption, and reproduction. You need to imagine a household owning a flock of sheep and uh, then uh, spinning yarn to make uh, woven or knitted clothing that would then be consumed in the, and worn in that household. Um, it's a, not a commodity economy, it's a household economy. Um, the household encompassed reproduction as well. The relation of husband and wife was the only legitimate site for heterosexual intercourse and the only site of legitimate childbirth. Bastardy was massively stigmatized, um, a vastly second class way of going through the world. The wife was important in terms not only of reproduction but in production. And here I can go back all the way to Old English, where the words, we have the, the precedent for the words lord and lady come from words in Old English before the Norman conquest that mean the keeper of the loaf of bread. And lavor, the, the word loaf is in the word lord. Um, or the keeper of the key of the cabinet in which the bread is maintained. It had a huge real world counterpart um, in a book that I love called Building Old Cambridge that tells the story of the establishment of white settlement in Harvard Square area, um, the, all the buildings uh, were both residences and sites of production, blacksmith, grocer. The husband, father, master would reside there with the wife, children, and servants, and all would be working in the same site. This is what Blasso meant when he de designated these relations economical. But the term, term economical was to undergo a massive shift, the first forgetting of my title. Both socially and in legal classification, the hus hus husband-wife relation and the parent-child relation moved away from the site of production and into a separate legal sphere, the domestic sphere. It happened in the middle of the century in the social world as well, right here in Harvard Square, um, with the Parent, the husband and wife and parent and child leaving the smithy, leaving the grocery, and um, moving into family homes in Cambridgeport, where I live. Um, the uh, Legally, the, a corresponding thing happened. The law of master-servant left the private economical relations and migrated to the law of contract, a category that appears nowhere in the table of contents of Blackstone's commentaries. As Duncan Kennedy, who's here tonight, um, shows in an early work, The Rise and Fall of Classical Legal Thought, the law of contract also had to evolve to make the, undergo this transformation. Before the, trans, before the transformation, he detailed, um, contract, treatises that were, contract treatises were rich in legal requirements for each contract type, 
lease, bailment, sale. The, the, there was not merely implied at law, but you had to have these rules, lots and lots and lots of them. Um, but, um, uh, as, but as they began to represent contract as free, this had to change. Contract needed to shift from a base in the will of the state to a base in the will of the parties. The bare minima of offer, acceptance, and consideration were common to all contracts and became the table of contents of the contract's treatise replacing contract type. This is the legal form in which we can see the rise of laissez-faire. So socially, say slavery was abolished, indenture waned, leaving freedom of contract as the modal labor relation. We are on our way to the constitutionalization of the right of freedom of contract uh, to sell one's labor um, in Lochner. And etymologically, the word economical shifted as well. It required the meaning of, and this is from the OED also, of related to or concerned with the social, the science of economics or with the economy in general, relating to the development and regulation of the material resources of a community or state. For a while, both the household meaning and the economics meaning co-resided under the term economic, but then came my first and second great forgettings. The economy took over the term, ejecting the household and with it the now reduced family. The economy became the market simpliciter, just the market. Big things had to happen to the husband and wife and parent and child to force them out of this new economy. How this happened in US law is distinctive. Jurors settled on the reconceptualization of marriage as status, not contract. Every contract, every family law casebook covers over this, this distinction um, quite, quite intently. By status, the jurors of the mid 19th century meant many things. Marriage was fundamental to the social order. It was saturated with legal requirements of mutual obligation that the parties cannot evade. It is indissoluble. It is the sole site of legitimate sexual reproduction, and it is incapable of modernization that was the, of the modernization that was roiling the, so, the world of the market. Thus, it was a traditional, immemorial, a site of lack. Um, the will of the state, not the will of the parties, prevailed. Out of Blackstone's private economical relations, the domestic relations treaties was born. Nothing but the husband and wife and parent and child. The legal category of domestic relations thus corresponded with the private domestic homes of Cambridge Port. And so we see a basic legal and social architecture of capitalism in its mid 19th century rise. The, the what we call in my vast study group, the family market distinction. Um, Great oppositions are arranged by this distinction, and which persists in many ways to today, either as a reality or as a lie. It has both, both features. Um, first, the market is a site of individualism, of the individual, and of self-interest, versus the family as a site of altruism and mutuality. The market as male and masculine versus the family as female and feminine. The family was said to be a haven in a heartless world. Separate spheres ideology, with women bearing the responsibility for interpersonal moral life, chastity, motherhood, sentiment. Another dimension on which vast differences were arranged across the family market distinction, market was important, and the family became increasingly marginal. Again and again, the self-interested utility maximizer of economic theory has no gender because family and women are gender, and they are not modernizing. They are lag. They are marginal to political economy. They can be forgotten, the third and fourth big forgettings of my title. Thus, our term family law exceptionalism, um, FLE, uh, the family, women, and gender as exceptions to the central facts of economy, contracts, markets, and individual self-interest. Okay, so that's part one. Part two, that's the American story. 
Um, but FLE is also a global story. Thanks to, again to the work of Duncan Kennedy, we can get a start in this. He's uncovered for us the fact that a German jurist, Frederick Karl von Savigny, in 1840, published a second volume of his eight-volume system of modern Roman law, much later, later <clears throat> translated into English as jural relations or the Roman law of persons as subjects of jural relations. There he crafted a, distinguished, a distinction that was to travel the world on the soaring wings of colonial capitalism. And you'll be able to see why as I lay it out for you. Um, the law of obligations, he's a German jurist, so he's talking about German and civil law. <clears throat> the law of obligations, which embraced both property and contract for Saddam Savini, were the opposite of the law of the family, and he used the term family law. Um, the law of obligations was universal in the sense that it had to be the same everywhere, and whereas the law of the family was local in the sense that it had to reflect the spirit of the people whose law it was. And the law of contract was also, while universal in the sense that it had to be the same everywhere, was particular in that every contract had to be determined by the will of the parties. The precise form that they agreed upon will took had to be left alone, laissez-faire, precisely, for them to decide. Um, it had to be contrary to their particular deal, whereas the law of the family within any jurisdiction was absolutely mandatory. All the marriages, all the husbands, all the wives, all the mothers were legally identical. They had to reflect the will of the state. Savigny could not possibly have known in 1840 how useful this would be for colonial expansion. The, uh, it essentially mandated free trade under the law of the colonizer, German, English, French law, for all contracts. The Code Civil had to be adopted for commercial interchange um, between the metropole and the periphery. But again and again, the colonizer was willing to ded dedicate to local elites or just forget about and let them take hold of a category known as the law of the family. It emerged um, where, you know, wherever we have studied this, and we've studied it in many places, nothing like family law formerly existed. Legal categorization did not follow that category. Instead, it was um, invented to house the new residualized non-contract uh, law that the colonizer was willing to grant to local elites. Um, often it was religious authorities who received this domain. Often it was termed personal status law or the law of persons, following some language in the French code civil terms for the law of marriage, parentage, etc. Often it was represented as indigenous, as tradition, but again and again, and as I said, it was an invented tradition. We have quite a large bibliography now in my study friend circle on the very distinctive ways in which this happened all around the world. The earliest contributions that I'm aware of are Loma Abu Adeh's account of modernization of, of Egyptian family law. I supervised Filomena Sukla's dissertation um, giving the story of the, story of the pivotal low role of local religious control over the family in making Greece as a modern nation state. And Yun Ru Chen's dissertation uh, direct, uh, addressed the directly Savinian scholarship produced among Taiwanese legal elites that drove FLE into the heart of debates about the right colonization and decolonization for Taiwan. We have accounts of the emergence of the Savinian pattern in French Algeria, in India, in Pakistan, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin American jurisprudence. And so the story that I told you in the first part of this talk of the United States version is just one, and it was an unimportant one compared to the others. It was a little peripheral country. Um, the, uh, because of this really remarkably repeated event, um, the things I said about markets and families in US law are strong hypotheses for sites all over the world. 
Just hypotheses. It didn't have to happen. No one was cramming it down from on top. It just kept happening. Um, and so FLE and the four forgettings are very uh, likely to be or possible to be there um, in their own distinctive forms. Okay, so FLE. We're up against FLE, up against family law exceptionalism. That's our entry point. And I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it. This is just what we've been doing. Um, FLE is our entry point into the study of gender law and political economy. Um, the people I work with closely could be said to be on a shared project of re-economizing sex, sexuality, gender, and the family. And in the process, we've developed things to say about the economy. Um, that resets, resexuality, regender, and refamily it. So we're moving the divided spheres back into each other. Um, uh, we derive plenty of help from Marxist feminists. Um, here are some hypotheses that you can bring to the world from them. Borrowing from world systems Marxists, Joan Smith and Emmanuel Wallerstein, we return to the concept of the household in order to free ourselves of the sometimes too limiting concept of the family. For any person, whatever group or groups of human constitutes that person's means of day-to-day -day survival and persistence as a member of the social body can be that person's household. I ask my students, you have roommates. Would your roommates, if you were really sick, take you to the emergency room? If the answer is yes, that's a household. They're engaged in your social reproduction. If they would call 911, they're just roommates. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that means that you can be in more than one household, because you can be a student at Harvard Law School with roommates who would take you to the hospital, and also be planning to go home to be with your parents on every vacation and merge back into the family of origin. You can be economically dependent upon them. Um, so you're in two households. Um, so uh, the, the idea of the household then as an income pooling and redistribution strategy for their survival and perpetual perpetuation of human beings. Okay, in the Marxist feminist large discussion, um, the household has become the site of the reproduction of human beings, the reproduction of the workforce, and of consumption. The, the key word in this work is in the title of this mini series social reproduction. Marxist feminists make a big distinction, which can be traced back to Marx and Engels. Um, we weren't very interested in it, but they did make it, between the mode of production appropriate to the market and the mode of production appropriate to the household. The former generates surplus value in the form of exchange value, while the latter generates surplus value in the mere, unimportant, less important, mode of use value. So whereas labor and capital meet on the factory floor to make widgets that capital then appropriates when they fall off the assembly line and tries to sell them on the market for more than the value of the inputs, that's the surplus, um, the, uh, the difference is the surplus. In the household, the wife mother takes flour, salt, yeast, and water to make bread that is more valuable because of its usefulness than, um, it, than the inputs. It is then not sold, it's not a commodity, but directly consumed for the social reproduction of the husband, father, and child who become the appropriators, as the capitalist is the appropriator in the factory floor, the husband, father, and the child are the appropriators in the household of the wife's surplus labor. As far as capital is concerned, and moving on now to another phase of feminist Marxist feminism, capital can depend on households to generate and distribute use values and to keep us alive, to get us at work, to be people who know what time is and so to show up on time, people who know how to keep a checkbook. Um, uh, and it can count on the family, on the household to do this for capital and just forget it, just not think about it. Um, but for Marxist feminists, 
Um, the set essential goal is to pinpoint the mutual dependency of the market in the household. As um, students in the course that I'm teaching with VLA right now, Gender and Political Economy, are learning, there are many ways to do this. One way, you can make the husband the capitalist of the family and the wife the proletariat. You could do it differently. You can designate the household a distinct class process from that of capital. You can say it's a feudal class process, but characterized not only by the husband's appropriation of values values generated by the wife, but also fealty, loyalty, affection, um, love. Um, you can say that the market presupposes, depends on structures, and exploits the household, that there's a direct need of capital for the household, and so the household is just being sucked up into the generation of surplus, surplus value in, in the market relations. Or you could say that the household makes demands on the market, which capital ignores at its peril. And we have a different author corresponding with each of those sentences in our syllabus that I'd be happy to share with you. You can also reverse the direction of the hypothesis and study the market for the ways in which it contains tons of elements that govern the household, from working hours calibrated to respect household meal times, to um, our social security system in the United States, which provides social security to family members via the workers' wage relation. Um, and that is a, uh, in the, uh, it's hard to find that in the family law case book. It's in the employment law case book, but we call it family law. Um, I want to shift gear now. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which we're finding Marxist feminism to provide useful tools for breaking down FLE. Um, I want to shift gear now and offer another quite different set of hypotheses which allow the transposition of understandings of power relations of, in the market into the domains of sex, sexuality, gender, and the family. We pull them from the first pages of Robert Hale's distribution and coercion in the supposedly non-coercive state. Hale was an economist who was a law professor at Columbia Law School in the heyday of legal realism. It was also the heyday of Lochner, the enshrining of freedom of contract as a constitutional right. All legal eyes were on the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. But Hale said that to understand the contract between capital and labor, you need not to look at the Constitution, but at the background rules. He didn't use that term. We do, though, when watching move from the constitutional, glorious Manichaean constitutional struggle to the boring old private law upon which everybody is operating on a daily basis. Um, I would call them the background rules, specifically the law of not even of contract, but of property. The law of property indirectly made the labor contract what it was. This gives, gives us Hale hypothesis number one, don't be dazzled by the big Manichaean fight going on, shift to the background rules. Hale hypothesis number two was that in order to be able to see that the freely formed contract between capital and labor was also actually coerced, you had to strip the word coercion of its connotation morally bad. It's very hard to do. Um, you, but his theory, his thinking was, you just wouldn't let yourself see how coercive it was if you went in assuming that coercion was bad. You had to bracket badness and look for coercion without badness. Moral judgment comes in later in the, in, in the analysis. Hill hypothesis number three was that two things, the law of property and the human need to eat, made the non-owner, he has a person called the non-owner, who's kind of the picaresque figure in the little drama that the pages I'm looking at uh, falls as he wanders, struggles across the land, landscape of capital. Um, the non-owner's decision uh, uh, is uh, to uh, enter into a labor contract that is coerced. He, he, it's property and his hunger that drive him to contract. First, he must eat. But second, every way in which he could satisfy that need coursed through a world divided up into chunks of private property. The bag of peanuts, the tract of land for growing food, the components of which, from which to make something like a broom um, 
to, from which you could sell for money and then buy food were all property. And although the owner could permit the non-owner to have or use all these pieces of property, he vastly regularly declines to do so. Instead, he charges money for their use, by which, which by definition, the non-owner does not have, and remembering that he must eat. And so he is forced to the door of the factory owner, who says he can earn a wage by working on the stipulated terms in the factory. The hours, the working conditions, and the wage, but also the unquestioned assumption that the worker will gain no ownership interest in the product of his labor are all co they're, they're coerced not by any force, excepting the force of hunger combined with the unavailability of property across the entire landscape. Um, this, um, none of that is mandatory, but it is the uniform convention of owners. The non-owner is moving around, doing a million things. He's busy as possible, um, but he is ultimately coerced to work in a factory for a wage. Hale hypothesis number four is that the upside of the employment at will rule, the rule that both the owner and the non-owner have entered into the wage contract can terminate at any moment for any reason, means that the non-owner can withhold his labor from any particular factory owner. Though he is by far the weaker party in the labor relation, he has thus got what Hale calls counter-coercive power. Um, to the extent, so this isn't a domination theory. There's counter-coercion. There's life on the other side of the social hierarchy. There's resistance um, in this form of withholding labor. To the extent that the wage is higher than the, the worker's absolute bare subsistence needs, um, the level of support that a slave owner would dedicate to the social reproduction of a slave, the non-owner worker has counter-coerced the owner employer to pay him that additional increment. Okay, then Hale hypothesis five is that it is, is that it is the encounter of these coercive and counter-coercive moves that distributes income throughout the community. And now we finally come to the moral moment. It is that distribution can strike us as profoundly unfair. That's the moment at which we can make a judgment. And uh, it is the distribu distribution of the surplus, not the coercion that informed it, I, that I believe stank in Hale's nostrils. Um, but the background rules, together with hunger, <coughs> underlie the distribution, and modifying the background rules can change it. Changing them to increase the bargaining power of the non-owner introduces no new coercion or no new unfreedom <coughs> into the market. Um, it merely shifts some of the coercion that is already there so that the bargaining endowments it enables, a term that we derived from another essay, and I can talk about that if, if you <coughs> ask the question. Um, bargaining endowments created by the background rules, um, you can shift them so that the bargaining endowments run in a new direction. Um, there's no such thing in anywhere in this analytic for laissez-faire. I teach this set of hypotheses to virtually every student who ever comes to study with me. And it has been amazing over the 24 years in which I've been doing that here at HLS to see how often they appear in work that follows that those students then produce on sex, sexuality, gender, and the family, an entirely different setting than the factory floor. That is the um, model thing that Hale offers. Three former students are on tomorrow's panel, the second part of this mini-series, and they all show us ways of doing this. I'm going to recap their projects right now, and um, uh, as an enticement for you to come to the panel tomorrow to learn more about law, gender, and political economy of social reproduction. So here's what they're roughly going to do, and I've checked these with them, so it's hopefully not wrong. Um, Hilash Shamir, who's here, you want to raise your hand, um, uh, takes up the anti-trafficking regime, the global uh, treaty uh, regime, sought by some feminists to be dedicated to prostitution and its abolition 
because of the per se coerciveness of the sale of sex, in their view, and reconfigures it as the criminal enforcement branch of a huge and internally diverse world, world of low-wage migratory labor. All of Hale's hypotheses matter here, as does the de-exceptionalization of sex, which becomes a labor commodity for sale on vulnerable and gendered terms, just as agricultural and construction work do. Yuran Zhang is an expert on market, and where's Yuran? There you are, she's right here, um, is an expert on markets for care that attach themselves to family life in the United States. She is de-exceptionalizing the family vis-a-vis -vis the market. She has published a paper on the, quote, child care economy, um, showing how non-parental child care is institutionalized in markets that range from the almost entirely informal to the hyper-regulated and formal. And tomorrow she will discuss her new project on government-subsidized long-term in-home care um, provision, a topic, incidentally, that was the center of Hila's dissertation, um, a market that operates in the home. Um, and Claudia Torres, in the back row, um, will share findings from her multi-year fieldwork study of two street sex work markets in Mexico City. Um, this is itself a de-exceptionalized space, sex as labor. She replaces the abolitionist hypothesis, feminist abolitionist hypothesis of pure domination with a Halian bargaining analysis that reveals how the sex workers whom she observed have created informal governance in their community, over their, over their community, in their community, it's imminent in their community, social norms that they use to produce the surpluses they seek and cherish and, the, and to control the harms that they despise. So um, the work goes on. Um, I'm incredibly proud to be associated with so many people doing so many interesting things. OK, that's it. <laughs> And now I'm going to go over there and put on the little thing. And if Vanessa has a question for me, we'll have a question or two. And then we'll take questions from you all. I think we're supposed to go to this. Yes. This is a great opportunity for me to ask a few questions. I'm just so curious uh, about. Um, so I guess just to get us or get me warmed up, um, I wanted to know um, basically how did you get to this place of reflecting upon the family? <coughs> Hi, Janet. <laughs> um, the family market distinction. And I guess I'm, I'm just trying to reflect on the arc that has been your scholarship, starting from uh, don't, uh, you know, and then I guess something like split decisions and making this genealogy of uh, what has been many, many decades of feminist thinking and feminist activism in the US, but then going to governance feminism and then arriving here. Not that it's completely unrelated, but I definitely see an arc there. And I just wanted to know oh, what's so the... So don't was my, can, can you hear me? Is this working? Yeah. Um, don't was my book on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the mil uh, Clinton's military anti-gay policy. And it was part of a suite of things I was doing in the aftermath of Hartman against Bowers, which held that homosexual sodomy was, could be criminalized in the United States as a matter of constitutional law, which was decided at the end of my first year of law school. Um, that's part of my massive lifelong struggle with identity politics. Um, and uh, the, uh, the don't ask, don't tell was precisely the evil thing that it was because it played on the slippery and unstable character of homosexual identification not it's sincere, deeply held, this is what I really am born that way kind of thing. And um, you know, so that's a part of my work. It's, 
it's really such a relief to get away from those spaces and work on the family. Um, the, uh, first of all, I'm not so full of ressentiment. Um, and, and secondly, um, I think it's just, this is making my heart noise. Oh, it's me. I just couldn't hold it. It was me. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I think it's going to do it again. Because it's, yeah. you put it on top, where it's on top. Yeah. Good work. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the exceptionalization of the family is so clear if you started teaching family law when I did in 1980. The case books were all about moral life, sentimental life, and um, altruism, and uh, regulated altruism. And the, in the Irene casebook, the Irene family law casebook, which was the first feminist casebook, there were 15 pages on all the rules of family property, all the rules of division of property at the time of divorce, on um, forced inheritance, of, you know, everything. Um, and so family law, if you teach it, taught it back then, you would be facing family law exceptionalism. This is not the market. This is not economically important. This is not even important. Um, ever since the feminists started writing family law case books, the men all fled, and they basically founded the program on negotiation. Um, <laughs> and so, so it became what I call the powder room of the, of the, of the curriculum. And, and what, so it, this is a, a long-term struggle to put economic interests back into the analysis of a very emotionally important, sexually important, um, often violent uh, form of the private sphere. And so it was just unbelievable to me to be able to get to the early work of Duncan Kennedy. I mean, one of the reasons we're so lucky in my work on sexuality and sex, sexuality, gender, and the family is that Duncan Kennedy, from the very beginning of his career, always knew that they were important and always took them into account. And so when I discovered, thank you, Duncan, um, when I discovered the rise and fall of classical legal thought, you know, it, it just, it was, it was like a magic wand making a million things I knew about family law just burst into life. And, so, um, so it's very, very important to me. Um, but it's, it's, it's a, a relief to get away from the struggle with identity politics by going to that, that place. One, one of my goals is that men should take my family law class. Why? Because men care about families too. Um, okay. Yeah, on that, it's great that you ended up on that note. Yeah, okay, great. Um, it's great that you ended on that note because uh, I guess too long, so she... I mean, <laughs> um, the next thing or the other thing that I wanted to ask is about precisely thinking about um, social reproduction and how the trajectory of family law exceptionalism has made the household or the family the place of the woman and labor the, or the capital of the factory the place of the man, it's male. Um, and in the process of undoing or thinking about undoing family law exceptionalism, uh, I'm guessing there has to be a place to conceptualize the role of the man in reproduction. Yeah. Uh, in this process of enmeshing again, I guess, the, the household or the family and the market, uh, there must be some way of thinking about that. Um, I, I, I wonder whether, for example, Marxist feminists, Marxist feminism, uh, if you if you think it's it's a good entry point to get to that process of imagining this figure of the man in the household that is part of reproduction. Yeah, I think in the order that I reported the Marxist feminist framings, the 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 most um, the antagonistic framing of the husband father as the capitalist and the wife mother as the proletariat um, is uh, uh, it some people really like it I find it a little ridiculous because the um, the it, 
first of all, I, I don't buy it that there's no production in the household. I don't buy it that there's only use values produced in the household. I think there's actual production in the household. Um, I don't think that I, there's, re, there's production of human beings, new human beings, and there's production of new human beings for far more than uh, the ability to collaborate as labor for capital. It's not just reproduction of the workforce. There's a lot more going on there. And, um, and the husband and the wife, what they, if, you, if you put production, reproduction, and consumption all in the household rather than just reproduction and, and consumption, then you're opening up the door to not heavily typifying the male and the female roles. And so you can open your eyes to ways in which the men do important reproductive labor and the women selfishly exploit their husbands. Okay, and um, so the um, so the, um, the you can you can see more, and uh, we have a favorite piece called "Hewers of Cake and Drawers of Tea" by J.K. Gibson Graham. Um, I think it was the reason that Vanessa wanted to have me for a dissertation supervisor is because I draw draw her attention to this paper, and at the beginning. The wives are all saying the husbands do nothing. They just sleep. They do no work, excepting, you know, at the, at the mine. It is a mining town. And, but then the men are put on this brutal seven day roster, and then they start noticing that the, the husband's not there to take the kids on the weekend to the sports games. They don't, he doesn't know to take the garbage out because he doesn't know what day of the week it is anymore because he's working seven days in, the, in a row and then gets a few days off. And then, Seven more days, and found another shift. So, so the 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 uh, reproductive labor of the husband of the husband became visible because of a massive shift in the market. And I take that as a paradigmatic what you want to have happen. You want to see more. And the reason why I was drawn towards that um, piece is because um, I, I was raised in a mining town. Um, Janet knows this story. Basically, the person, we're really selling this story now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a story about a mining town uh, where there's a very, very strict uh, separation between production and reproduction in a way, um, or, or that's how Gibson and Graham started to tell the story yeah. at, one, at one point. They're Marxist feminists, yes, so they, they exactly. see it that way. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I guess my favorite part about that story is precisely. Um, making visible what the role of the husband is in social reproduction, uh, because as, as I've told you, and it's, it's, it's my experience growing up, I did see my dad very much involved in uh, many ways of social reproduction that really, I, I feel, were captured by this piece in Gibson Graham that you uh, introduced me to, and which has kept me following you for the last three or four years. Oh, shucks. <laughs> um, so, um, you want to tell precisely the the weird way in which that unraveled or sure. it took shape? Is... Yes, so in, in this weird world that is a mining town, one of the ways the company draws talent is through creating a really, really good high school. Um, and so my parents basically decided to move to this place um, for many reasons, but among them is the opportunity to put me and my sister in this really, really good high school that you could have they could have not afford if they were living elsewhere in Colombia, where, where I was raised. Um, and my dad wor worked for 30 years in this mining town. By the end of it, he hated his job, but he could not quit because that would, until my sister and I graduated from, the, from, from high school, um, my mom, though, for the last part of our life there, could get jobs outside of the mining town, go back. She was uh, you know, more free to take whatever job she wanted to move outside or inside the mining town, well, my dad couldn't do that. So it was my dad there basically sacrificing or doing the sacrifice uh, to put a lot of human capital in me and my sister. Um, and so that's no, one of the ways. get a doctorate from Harvard Law School. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the, oh, can I get that too, too close? It seems like shouting. The, um, Notice that the dad did social reproductive work not in the home, but by staying in a job he hated. So it, it crisscrossed the categories again. Yeah. 
This is being recorded, so if you have any questions, pitch it to the mic. And thank you for this. Uh, well, so thank you both. So I, should, so I have two questions. I mean, one is, is around the connection of law of the family to colonial expansion. I mean, is your sense, Janet, that, uh, that there is still uh, sort of dynamic in which family law exceptionalism structures imperial relations. Um, and then the other question, which is actually a question that Brenda asked me a long time ago that I was never able to, to address, was um, in your use of Hale and for bringing up to CLS, are background rules, is there any difference between talking about background rules on one hand and saying that you know, the sort of LPE claim that law structure social relations, is there any distance between between those two positions? Uh, so the first, I, I think it was a um, non-necessity, but a matter of huge consequence for women all over the world that family law became women and women became the marker of the nation through the idea that family law had to be, had to track the spirit of the people. Um, that meant, and in many places traditional and in many places religious. And so that meant for women that they had a symbolic role that was international, but out of their hands. And um, so it was like they were being ventriloquized. The, the um, part of the Chatterjee has a wonderful chapter called The Nation and Its Women. And it's a story of how, um, his story of, of how Hindu nationalists under colonial rule attached the nation to women who then had to carry off the nation. Um, they had to be virtuous, they had to be home-oriented, they had to be religious, they had to be traditional. They, you know, they got some advantages out of that. They got to run around teaching each other stuff and getting an education. It wasn't all bad, but, um, but it, it was, that, that then put them in the way to become the primary battleground for human rights. So again, fighting between other people on an international scale in which they're being ventriloquized. And so I, I think it's immensely important and continues, but I don't, I don't think it's, um, I, yeah, I, that's, that's how I'd answer your first question. The second question, the idea of a background rule depends on the idea of a foreground legal phenomenon. And so it, it's highly contingent. If I concentrate all day on the family law, then I've made family law the foreground. And we could, we could say, oh, well, but what's the background? And it might be religion, or it might be, um, uh, it might be some um, education, or it might be you know, something else. So, so what is in the background is what's, what's behind this, this, the bright, shiny thing that's in front, and it's very contingent. So I'm not saying that I know what the background rules are. But the, kind, but the way we use it in my um, discussions, we tend to say the background rules create bargaining endowments for a variety of players who then engage in social negotiations with each other with strengths and weaknesses created by those bargaining endowments. 
and you and this is one form of legal indeterminacy, you then can get surprising outcomes because a lot of the way the law operates is through complex social action in the, using the background rules that bar, the, the bargaining endowments of background rules. So, so you could you 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 can imagine a dominance feminist saying sex work is um, male violence. It's it's rape. Re, it's it's serial rape punctuated by payment. It's it's the eroticization of domination and the and of subordination. It's it, it's, uh, it, it, it's it's top down power. Um, well, it certainly can be, but what people working with this set of hypotheses will often do is they'll go into a sex work situation or a prostitution situation and identify a variety of players. The person who really started us off in this direction, by the way, was Prabhakota Swaran in the dissertation group for Duncan. And, and she identified the not only the prostitute and the client, but the landlord. She moved to the background of, of landlord-tenant law and discovered that it was landlord-tenant law that made some prostitutes stronger bargainers that better paid, better working conditions, could take care of their kids at the brothel. It was perfectly good to have the kids at the brothel. It was fine. And others to be in virtual slave-like uh, conditions of uh, coming out of the way landlord-tenant law was, um, of course, through their daily lives. So that's what we mean by it. Um, it's just a hypothesis. You don't need to do it. It's not mandatory whatsoever. It, but it might be useful one day. So that's why I mentioned it. Um, that's all. So it's not intended to be a total theory of law. Is that helpful? I've got the mic over here. Hi, Amy Kaczynski. Um, Hi, Amy. Thank you so much for this. I'm really looking forward to the discussion tomorrow. I, um, I teach a section on social production in my political economy uh, and law class. and. Um, um, looking forward to sort of more community and more work on these questions because I think there's a sort of surprising lack of them in political economy circles today. Um, so I have two questions. Um, one is about Hale, who I also um, teach in that class. Um, one reaction I get, and I have of my own actually about the Hale, is resistance to the move you describe about suspending the moral, um, you know, kind of oh, critique yeah. of coercion. Um, or power in the um, allocation of those you know, sort of coercion allocation of power. Um, and the one reason for that is that I think the move that Hale is making um, to say everybody's coercing everybody else is a very particular move in order to reject an argument about freedom mm -hmm. uh, and where freedom lies in you know, relation to contract. Um, it's not social analysis, right? And so, no, pure modeling. It, exactly. And so, like from a from a social relations perspective, we might say it's actually quite important to not collapse the notion that the laborer coerces the the firm the same way the firm coerces the laborer, um, and that that um, that that's a step down a road which might have various problems if you continue down that road about um, uh, erasing a field of social power that is not always coterminous with law or uh, exhausted by law, um, but that you'd want to be able to have something like a class analysis that would actually reflect that there were equal forms of coercion going on here. And that's not just a distributional matter, it's about coercion. Um, and, and social relations of coercion. So I wonder whether you puzzle about this same thing and what you make of it. Um, so that's the first question. The second is um, I, um, I'm really interested in social reproduction outside of the family, and I appreciated how you framed the family as, as one place to start in the discussion about political economy and, and social reproduction. But I wonder what the, the, the moves that you're making and the community that you're building um, uh, would um, would do if you started with social reproduction outside of the family. Um, and so I, in part because I've worked on healthcare for a really long time, I'm very interested in formal 
um, uh, or sort of market-oriented um, locations of, of caregiving and social reproduction. Um, and um, and I, I wonder how, um, how so, sort of what, it, what, what you see when you start with the family and, and um, family law exceptionalism and what you would see if you started outside of the family. And so that's just a sort of open invitation to, to say some more about what you might think about, about that. Oh, great questions. Um, the, uh, I, I, I understand the resistance to thinking about coercion the way Hale asks us to um, as um, a almost, I don't know, by the time you're 10 years old, if you've grown up in a liberal market economy, you think freedom is good and coercion is bad. I, I mean, you learn it. You learn it at a level that you don't know you know it. And um, so asking a, a person who's grown up that way, oh, just bracket the morality of coercion, is really asking a lot. Um, the um, Hill does it for a, a heuristic reason. He does it so he can see all the coercion because he doesn't believe he'll see all the coercion if he has to also think it's bad. But it could go the other way. You know, it could, he, he would see more coercion than there was if he had to think that it was bad. Um, but he does think it's distorting to assume that it has a moral valence and that it, you could see more of it. He could see more of it if he bracketed its moral badness. That has no necessary implication for the relationship between coercion and counter-coercion. They are not the same, would be my answer to your students. It comes to me from my students as well. They're not the same. The property owner has the benefit of the commons having been enclosed, so there's no free property for the um, non-owner to run some hens or chickens and horses and sheep on. It's a huge fact of modern capital is the enclosures um, that exposed the working class to property in this unmediated, unescapable way. And I think Hill's model captures that well. Um, it is the his non-owner turns and turns and turns and turns and turns and turns and confronts property again and again. So it's a serial drama, not a single drama. Um, and all the owners could be nice and let you know could it would be the Hopelvian privilege, no right, journal relation. They, they could just allow the use of the land or of the straw or of the peanuts, but they don't, and they don't, and they don't, and they don't. So it's a historically complex, even in the, in the model, it's a historically complex repeated clusterfuck. And so that's not very like the factory owner, the, the non-owner saying, I'll, I'm going to refuse to work for this factory because I could conceivably work for that one instead. The withholding of labor is similar to the withholding of the free use of property. It comes from the same Hopewellian dynamic about rights and duties and privileges and no rights, but, but it, it's socially so tiny compared to the massed property that the non-owner faces. So I just, we're, we're not making a claim um, through Hale that this isn't a vastly social, unequal relation. It is. And um, so, so I think it's been very helpful to me in my feminism to confront dominance feminism with the concept of counter-coercion. 
Um, and uh, the uh, and here I'm up against I'm up against a form of identity politics that repeatedly needs dominations to be very massified, solid, top down, perfect. Um, I personally think that's letting them get away with a false story about themselves a lot of the time. So anyway, but I'm a really bad girl and I have tenure, so I can say that. And um, the, uh, now your second question, I don't know if that was an adequate answer, but it is, yeah, the second question. I think it would be a, a very exciting reversal to put care in the institutions of the market and to allow yourself to see it there. And to, to see, to allow yourself to see the generosity, the altruism, the gentleness, the love that happen in the institutions, for instance, of healthcare or in, you know, the institution of education. I mean, one of the things I tell my students, and this probably isn't very smart, but I, I can't do better than this, is I tell my students when, so every now and then a student might annoy me. It, it's conceivable. <laughs> And um, what I try to do at that time is I ask myself, what would this person's mother want me to do? <laughs> and it's, it's like I'm interjecting care and love into my relationship, which is really quite a different type of relationship with the student, right? Um, I'm pantomiming the mom. And, um, because the, the student is annoying me and I want, I want to find the right way for the student even though, you know, and, and overcome my emotions. So, so thinking about affect, thinking about emotions, thinking about, you know, the, um, uh, uh, for Claudia's dissertation, the big breakthrough was when we discovered the literature on moral economies. The, the sex work community had a moral economy um, this goes back to E.P. Thompson and the making of the English working class that was completely not the, um, the, the ethic of the Manchesterist uh, factory economy. And so losing those things, Amy, losing those things is losing too much. And so I, I totally get that and endorse that, yes. And then, and then, of course, there's the hybrid figures who bring the market into the family or the family into the market, and um, and the nanny or Yvonne's home health care and Yvonne's home health care workers. Um, yeah. So this is. I want to proclaim myself as your surplus one part of your surplus value, Janet. <laughs> so I had the. This privilege so <laughs> of having Janet Halley just about 30 years ago as my civil procedure professor in 1994 at Stanford Law. And then, of course, I followed her into the second semester of my first year in Races and Nations, mm -hmm. and then couldn't graduate without also taking family law in my third year. Um, so 30 years. Thank you, Janet. I've been following you and chasing you since I want to say that now, 30 years later, I can be here with my surplus value, my daughter, who is a junior in the college. Um, but I wanted to say I loved how you also just gave a shout out to your generations of uh, SJD students in particular, but students including two of my colleagues at Georgetown Law, Lama Abu Ode and Philomena uh, Sukales. But also the JDs. And the JDs. The JDs who go into law teaching yeah. en masse. Yeah. yeah. Shirali Munshi, Kaysu mm -hmm. Park, so many of my colleagues that came through Georgetown or are at Georgetown, we all studied with you, Janet, um, and are learning from you constantly. I did not go into family law. I teach in intellectual property law. And so what I cover is the knowledge economy. And I'm currently writing about cultural appropriation. And I was fascinated by uh, your language of 
you know, it, it basically uh, dissecting the non, the supposed non-market space of the family, but talking about the appropriation of the surplus value by the father and the children, et cetera. Um, but the, what I didn't hear as much about is the investment, and I think this goes to Amy's second question, right, where she touched on in your answer just now, but the investment that we have and the difficulty of letting go with all that we've stuffed into this, the spaces of the other, the altruism, the care, the moral, um, and and because this is something I'm confronting in the work around cultural appropriation in the context of um, the uh, cultural production. So indigenous people standing for the traditional and the indigenous, but also the religious, the spiritual, the non-commodifiable um, as something that we should celebrate and protect and the, the pushing back against the market language and Marxist view from feminist Marxism to racial capitalism in these spaces as well as um, so just just generally in my sphere, thinking about the public domain as kind of the family, this like uh, extra legal space. But but I wanted to hear maybe you talk a little bit more about uh, why some of these claims, the the you know pushing back against the dominance view, but the the resistance view is getting recast as neoliberal is getting recast, uh, recast um, it, it, at least in my sphere, right? And so I wanted to hear a bit more about. Uh, how do we uh, have both and and not yet, but but not reify these spaces as separate and exceptional? So that's one question. Um, the other one was just, and, and I don't know if any of your students are working on this or if you thought about this, but in thinking about what we're seeing in uh, uh, South Korea and Japan and the declining population and women refusing to get married as some kind of mass labor movement. Um, and I was thinking about, I don't know if you've seen this great uh, show on Netflix, but it's called The Full-Time Wife Escapist, and the premise is a Japanese woman who refuses to get married, but then she also enters into a um, contractual married, marital relationship. Um, and, and it is really a in, very interesting uh, critique of gender relations and, and marital relations there, but, but curious about thinking about this global phenomenon that we're seeing and some of the state's really inept state inept responses to thinking about what is really kind of percolating from below with respect to the gendered relations there. So two different questions. One in terms of like, can you give me any insights into how um, uh, some of what you may be seeing in this family context um, it, it might have some something for me to think about in terms of the knowledge economy debates around uh, the, terms to property and contract uh, by indigenous people, uh, people of color whose um, uh, uh, works have been appropriated uh, without credit, without remuneration, et cetera. Um, and then also some, some of this global, um, the global context that we're seeing too. Thank you. So, yeah, Monty was my um, student at Stanford, gosh, a long time ago. and. It's um, just wonderful. We've done some things together since. Um, I don't know the issues that you work on. Um, I would, uh, I, I would expect to see, though, serious framing differences between property rights, contract rights, property alienability as a path forward for these dispossessed artisan communities. Um, and, um, and understandings that don't individualize ownership, that collectivize it, that attribute the artifact to the group, and that seek to have some non-individual property way through the problem. That, that's where I would expect to see a, a critical tension. And um, 
I don't know, is that is that is that what you see and um, yeah, partly, and I, I definitely would want to follow up with you. About yeah, that. let's follow yeah, up and, on, and try on not, that. Because really, what I'm struggling with is what might an LPE framework bring yeah. to this uh, debate and this impasse. So I'm going to follow up with you about that. Yeah, it's um, you might want to also talk with Vanessa because Vanessa is going to be working on um, uh, indigenous activism in Colombian mining uh, uh, towns where there are real stakes in whether the indigenous activists act like modernized rights claimers or traditional you know manifestations of nature and uh, and you know there's there are real consequences to which way you go there and the stakes are, are pretty high. Um, now, on your second question, women's fertility strikes. Um, the uh, the um, the care overhang. The, you know the, the the immense importance of my generation of people about to create a huge demand for care. Well, we haven't reproduced sufficiently enough people to provide it, um, and uh, it, it's a, it's not just Japan and Korea, and um, it's uh, it, it's a, a massive event and it is impending upon us. And um, I think that the um, the sense of urgency is just not there. And uh, but. Um, I, I often um, think, I look at my students and I, I think of them as so not there yet with the experience of caring for dying parents and just how damn hard it is to get them to accept care and to get them good care if they will accept it. And you know, this is a global th phenomenon. And, so I, I mean, I, it, it's, 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 it's important. I, I by no means understand it or know enough about it. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a, a sociologist and I'm doing a postdoc here. And um, I, I, I'm really- Can you share your names with uh, Luis, Luis. Luis. Hi. Um, and I, I'm very interested in, I, 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 you know, very interested in, in your use of, of, of hail, and I, I, it made me think about even at a lower sort of level of abstraction, if, if, if property or, or housing, you know, the, the extent to which housing um, dynamics are at play in, in you know, in, in the contemporary boundary between the, the, the household and the market. In particular, I thought about this in terms of zoning law and the way that zoning mm -hmm. law uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 shapes the kind of uh, economic activity that that households can engage with and, and shapes. Uh, um, care work as well, but uh, your example of, of sort of, of, of uh, roommates and uh, as, as, as kinds of households uh, made me think of this as well, that we can think of housing markets uh, uh, having an effect on the kinds of co-residents that, that, that came to form. Or, so I'm, 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 I'm interested what it would look like to think about the household if, if, if you know you, the way you, you kind of think about it as, as, as being a site of consumption, of production, of kind of, um, of, uh, of um, reproduction. Of reproduction. Um, if we also think of co-residence as, as a central dimension of it, and, and that ties into kind of relationships of, of, of housing and property, right? And that, that, that are also kind of deeply structured. So I'm yeah, curious if you have. Totally a great question. Um, in, you know, I was the royal chair for 15 years. Um, the royal Chair Isaac Royal was the largest slave owner in colonial Massachusetts, and he gave a bequest in his will to Harvard College that um, established the royal chair and gave the college the right to, once they received the bequest, which took a long time for various reasons, um, to pick to have that chair filled by a professor of law, and they did. He was the first law professor at Harvard. And then I ended up with that chair. And so I, um, it was a heavy lift 
for a really long time because I knew for from the very beginning that it was, you know, it really stigmatized and problematic thing. Um, but by the time I knew that, I was already the royal chair. So what I did was um, I started taking tours out to the Royal House and Slave Quarters in Medford, which you can go there anytime you want and see where Isaac Royal lived. And they still have the slave quarters there. And they still have the back entrance that you, you, you walk from the slave quarters into the back entrance of the house directly into the kitchen. And there's a servant's staircase at the back of the house. You can't see the slave quarters from the house. There is no window allowing you to see it. Um, there are a million details there like that that tell you that it's the built environment of a slavery-based household. And then I take the students to the Grove, and we're going to do it this spring with our class, Hila and I are going to. Then I take the students to the Gropius house out in Lincoln, which is built by Walter Gropius, who did the Gropius dorms. And there you have, you know, a decentered front door. It, you know, it's a lot of the same elements, but modernized, modern, modern, modern. But there's a back door for the housekeeper, and she has a little room off the kitchen. And uh, so what the purpose of that exercise, which is a pretty compelling experience for everybody who participates, is to think, what is the built environment of a household economy, right? Um, I'm totally fascinated by that question. And I think of that paired tour as a way to share understandings about that with it, it, on the ground. Um, and uh, that's the best I've been able to do in that space uh, as not a housing person, not a, um, but, but it's pretty damn good. And if anybody wants to have the tour, just let me know and I'll set one up. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it'll shake you. Um, and uh, so, yeah, yeah. All right, last question. Hi, um, I'm E.T. I'm a, now a long ago graduated law student um, and a PhD candidate here. Um, and this question might be a little unfair um, given the uh, incredibly rich uh, historical story you've given us. Um, but I was wondering if you might have something to say on the question of legal reform, um, which is a question that I think LPE world more broadly um, finds itself confronting uh, pretty squarely. So another way to put that is that if the question, or if the project of kind of breaking down uh, family law exceptionalism is a kind of uh, historical, intellectual, um, political project of figuring out the truth from the lies, um, does it also kind of, to your mind, suggest certain things at the level of reform, or is the kind of truth lies project um, kind of by definition too contextual and the question of reform kind of also contextual. Huh. Well, um, this is a huge question and is I think one of the, if you give a group of students, JDs or graduate students, it doesn't matter which, $5,000 to organize a conference under one rubric or another, this is what it's going to be about. And um, so uh, the, um, the, the, I, I would say that many, many of the projects that have been done by various people in the conversations that I kind of tried to summarize today although they're very rich intellectual projects, academically totally legitimate, made them law professors, you know, took a lot of library work or field work or um, various kinds of uh, genealogies or this or that or the other thing, many also came out with law reform proposals. I'm not going to speak for anybody. Um, but the ground is really thick with them, and 
there will be several that will be clearly implied by the presentations tomorrow. So if the presenters care to say then what they think their law reform implications are, but I, I don't want to I don't want to ramp them out before they decide whether they want to do that or not. But um, but I um, I there's no hostility in this undertaking to either huge intellectual investments of time and labor to in instrumentalizing that into into tools for incremental reform incremental reform non-revolutionary change um, I've, I'm simply not against non-revolutionary change so that is actually a very good segue to, uh, that you should join us tomorrow at 12 15 in 3016 right upstairs we're also about to uh the reception is just uh when we're down in lcnc and please join me in thanking both vanessa and professor Halley.